Okay, so I've done a lot of work looking at observations. What are the measurements? And it's like nature is revealing what's going on. We just have to listen. So this is the story that the Arctic climate is telling us if we're listening. So I've been a contributing author on the last three IPCC reports. And I would say that the science there is quite strong. Uh, David's point that there's an over-reliance on modeling, it's, it's a good point. There's also a lot of physical science in there. Uh, on reticence, I want to say that, as David mentioned, you need unanimous signatories from all of these nations, including Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Russia, these petro states. And that's one reason when the highest level reports, not the technical science reports that I just showed, but the, the summary for policymakers, the, the highest level, those get muted or blunted because uh, you have to satisfy these petro states. But I'll talk about Arctic climate I'm part of the climate expert group for an Arctic Council activity called AMAP, Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. We are publishing IPCC-like reports, thick, well-illustrated, externally reviewed compilations of the latest science. We've got a new one coming out uh, soon. And that process gave, gave me a uh, a high level view uh, of, of the full Arctic. So I will talk about Greenland, but I'll also zoom out to the Arctic and then connect the Arctic with the rest of the world. A bit about me, born at 326 parts per million CO2. In college, I was getting into astronomy and computer science when I took a course and realized that we were up 30% CO2. And um, it was, in fact, these healing curves uh, showing atmospheric pollutants on these mm -hmm. exponential rises that inspired me to step away from astronomy and try to focus on dealing with problems on planet Earth. I was fortunate to get connected to a research program in Greenland. And for 11 years of starting in my 20s, uh, I was installing and maintaining a network of automatic weather stations on the inland ice. So we had 20 of these kind of stations. Um, I spent more than a year camping on Greenland and this turned into a, a fantastic uh, career. I, after the University of Colorado, I went to Ohio State and I, in addition to meteorology coursework for nine years, I was teaching intro to environmental issues and, and uh, like world geography. And that gave me a really broad perspective on the global long dirty laundry list of environmental issues. Along the way, I continued working on Greenland, uh, doing a lot of kind of climatology uh, at the intersection of glaciology. And the types of learning, it became abundantly clear that, you know, the models can never really uh, reach this level of detail that we have in, in nature. Racked up a lot of publications. This is what people do in academic careers. They publish uh, technical articles. It's really tedious to write these things. And they compose a body of work that um, you know, allows me to talk about this stuff. Um, basically burned out and uh, took a, a job in, in Denmark, uh, reboot on my life, uh, got out of the academic thing because it's, it's quite a tough treadmill, and, uh, but continued to do this uh, climate 
recording work. The red circles are the Danish network. And we're actually now running both networks. So we, we're responsible for 40 of these stations. This ends up spending a lot of time on the ice. And what you see there is you're like, yeah, this, this is not in the models. And I want to talk about that. Um, uh, yeah. So I think a useful narrative is to follow the water. It's like if you want to understand politics in DC, Washington, DC, you follow the money. Well, if you want to understand the ice, uh, it's useful to follow the water. And let me take you to West Greenland. There's a dark band that's low on the ice sheet. Um, it is where you get a lot of lakes forming. The lakes like this one, it's 30 million cubic meters. They actually drain rapidly. Uh, they, and they are forming higher in elevation. Uh, they are draining more rapidly. And this is one example of factors that are not yet in the models. Yet these pools of water absorb more sunlight. When they drain, they lead to uh, a tectonic upheaval that, that kind of rips up the ice and the, the water flowing at the bed accelerates 3x. Uh, none of this is in the models. This is just one factor. The water drains in. It's several degrees warmer than the ice internally. And so the doubling of meltwater that's happened in the last 50 years, it's heating the ice internally. This thermal collapse is not in the models used to predict future sea level rise. The water then reaches the bed and it lubricates flow. This effect is not in the, the climate models. The water rushes out the front in, in places where the water terminates in the sea. It, it entrains uh, mud from the, the bottom of the ice and that you can see in this photo. The ice, the water is uh, turbulent. It forces a turbulent heat exchange uh, that you can see here. This is a convective heat transfer, much more efficient than uh, just thermal diffusion. Um, this cartoon illustrates how it's typical for there to be a warm layer below 300 meters. Um, that Those red arrows illustrate this warm Atlantic layer. Uh, the water, the fresh water rushing up the front of the ice, it entrains this this warm water and forces uh, force convection melting uh, right at the grounding line. That's that's where the ice uh, loses contact with with the ground. And erosion of ice right there is uh, the best way to get that ice to accelerate. And and that is increasing with both ocean warming and uh, increasing uh, force convection. Neither of those processes are in the models used to project uh, sea rise in the future. Hydrofracture, we see really big ice shelf disintegration during record warm summers. The rifts are being flooded with water. This is this hydrofracture effect is not in the, the models. The algal blooms uh, under prolonged sunshine uh, darken the surface, absorbs more sunlight. It's another amplifying effect not in the models. So you, you can see that when you stack up all of these actual processes, you get a, a response from the ice, which is much faster than it can be encoded in, in models. Uh, we, as David said, we, we simply cannot rely on, on models uh, for a lot of things at, at the, the level of fidelity that we're talking in, in, in nature, it, it's, uh, it's, it's infinite. And we're using like a fax machine to try to represent the process. It's, it's, um, it's not useful. All right, I wanna zoom out now. 
as I race through this material uh, to talk about the Arctic at large, um, what you have on the horizontal axis is time from 1880 to present. On the vertical axis, you've got latitude at the top, it's the North Pole. And the red colors you see on the right, that is the Arctic warming much faster than the rest of the world. I think that's the main significance of the Arctic. Its connection with the rest of the world is through Arctic amplified warming. And this uh, is a reconstruction from lakes and, and driftwood um, sh showing a, a summer cooling in the Arctic the last 2000 years. Uh, that was an orbital, orbitally induced cooling. Um, then there's an abrupt warming. This has this hockey stick shape that the abrupt warming is from industrialization, the addition of carbon pollution to the atmosphere. Um, and that takes us up to the present. The instrumental record is the, this red curve. Now, what I'm gonna show you next is I pasted on, I had to do this. I, I pasted on the projections of Arctic summer temperatures into the future. And this is what we have heading this is where we're heading. Same curve, uh, I had to put on the, the axis. Um, this, this should be you know, maybe front cover of the IPCC report, how um, even in an optimistic scenario, that's, there, there are two curves going off to the right. The Paris scenario, um, we're still looking at a huge warming in the Arctic. The business as usual is the six degrees of Arctic summer warming. Um, there is a difference between those two. Basically, by limiting carbon emissions and getting into carbon drawdown, uh, we can put on the brakes and we can slow down this disaster. But I, I'm sorry, it's it's we're not avoiding this. It, it is for sure coming um, for the foreseeable future. There would we would have to have an external uh, influence like a comet. That was the only. Thing that's that's in the cards uh, as unlikely as it is to alter this this uh, warming trajectory. Um, for AMAP, I made this uh, plot about um, sea level contributions from Arctic and Greenland. Okay, Greenland is the largest single contributor to sea rise in the world. Um, you, you add on Alaska, Arctic Canada, etc. You get these kinds of curves. The, the land ice, the, the glaciers, they are having a really delayed response to Arctic warming. And I do not consider them the primary concern. Um, nevertheless, these, the, the, the gray lines illustrate how in every successive decade, the, the rate of sea rise is increasing. Uh, in other words, it's accelerating. That much we know, we really can't, predict this other than using paleo data, like David was saying, it is uh, fair to conclude that at, um, at current CO2, we, we've baked in uh, 15 meters of sea level rise. That is the committed sea rise. Over the time scale, we don't really know. And it's so difficult to predict uh, when you're working with nonlinear curves, tiny changes in the initial conditions, uh, greatly affect the outcome and we, we lack the models to project this into the future. We do have paleo data and those do show we have had dramatic sea rise uh, in, in the past. Um, the you know, civilization has developed under extremely stable climate that's been called the Holocene. Um, that was preceded by the Pleistocene Ice Age. You can see the sea rise 120 meters of sea rise uh, after the disintegration of the Laurentide ice sheet and the Fennoscandian ice sheet, they're gone. Now we have a relic of ice sheet on Greenland and uh, the polar ice sheet in the south. Uh, anyway, the, the Holocene climate, very steady, sea level, very steady. This, when, when, the, 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 when the position of the, the coastline is predictable, if it, then you can build coastal infrastructure because the you can build that port city because the, 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 the sea isn't changing uh, rapidly. That's one of the factors that allowed civilization to develop like um, predictable rainfall patterns. 
uh, farmers could say, yeah, well, you know, it's this is the rainy season and it's like that more or less every year. That was uh, the Holocene. Um, in terms of sea rise, the big bend there for scale, um, this is our what we are faced with for the future. The time scale, it, it's it's hard to establish. Anyway, there, as you can see, there is a difference. If if we could lock in constant 1990 emissions, which would be pretty a pretty big achievement, um, we we're still looking at uh, tens of meters of sea rise committed. Um, business as usual, you know, 50 meters. I mean, tr imagine the impact on hundreds of coastal cities. It's it's a preposterous uh, concept. The the um, it, I, my final point. It's about um, how Arctic warming leads to uh, persistent weather extreme. In other words, droughts or flooding conditions. When when the weather gets stuck in one pattern, like it's raining, a little bit of rain's great, but if too much of a good thing, you get flooding. Um, that's what this is about. And Arctic warming is central to this, this issue. Um, the jet stream, the river of air that separates the cold air in the Arctic to the north and the warm air to the south, this depends on the Arctic being cold, but Arctic is warming 3x the rate of the world. What that is, that is doing is slowing down the jet stream, making it wave more and leading to more persistent weather extremes. Um, the, I'm just gonna, I, that, that's what this illustrates. It's a more, uh, north-south wave pattern and it's moving more slowly toward the east that is the emerging picture that's what's threatening um food security um there's lots of headlines like this 2015 2018 uh european heat wave this uh the the northwestern u.s um, pacific northwest it was the same thing this omega pattern um on the right there's if you can see the little omega symbol it's because of the shape of this wave um, a persistent high pressure over europe there means lots of sunshine and if that keeps up the crops start to fail you lose water security um, this pattern um, is how we're starting to get 40 degrees temperatures on continental europe and um, Think back to the Russian heat wave of 2010. That was one of these events. Uh, Russia halted grain exports. It sent global food price commodity spike, spiking. It led to food riots. This is um, what to expect uh, because of this uh, wave, wavy problem with, with the jet stream. And, and it's been very clearly documented in this and other articles where this is these are the wave numbers and this table has like the the august 2003 heat wave in europe more than 40,000 people died because they were unprepared for um the persistent um heat uh, actually 75,000 um died that heat wave summer there are other uh, the pakistani heat floods to 2010 um practically every year now has these types of extremes. This study, I think, really does well. Um, and John Schellenbuehler uh, that David mentioned, hes you can see him on the authorship of this article. its This is really hard science. Um, basically, the same authors um, later published uh, uh, an alarm bell about breadbasket failure because of this same wave pattern thing, uh, pointing out that um, the the grain that's grown in russia europe north america is strongly threatened by arctic climate heating that is is the what is the beginning of this story of of um this wave disruption of our weather patterns um this points to the concentration of population in the tropics uh, we're we're very fortunate uh, up north really um we will escape a lot of this um unrest 
at least it directly. Um, this is really a, a, a problem of the, the, or a bigger problem for the global South. This uh, horrible um, issue of, of migration um, will in, continue to intensify uh, because uh, the tropics be, are becoming unha uninhabitable. And also, as, as you know, politically unstable, it was a shitty political situation to begin with. And if you pile on top of that loss of food and water security, the, um, the, that is a very ungovernable situation. Um, yeah, that, that was my final slide. Um, sorry for having to race through all that material, but, uh, and sorry to ruin your Saturday evening, but hopefully, um, you know, this will give us some energy to, to get out there and, and, and make the world a better place.